sing that again, oh Lord. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare your greatness, oceans cry out to you, the mountains they bow down before you. So I joy.
you when I think of that last line, the triumphs of his grace. I can't help but think of our Savior's love. Isn't it so marvelous and wonderful and beyond our comprehension? Maybe sometimes we come into this room and we forget what's back here. Like, don't look at us, friends. Like, this cross is central because this, this is what we're here for. We're here to remember and celebrate and give praise to a God who loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live and walk on this earth and to save us from the penalty of our sins. What love. But he didn't stay dead, did he? The tomb is empty and we live in that hope of the power of the resurrection. And I, I feel like a broken record because I've been saying this so much, but because I, I think this is so much of the point of us coming here to remember this. We can't forget. It's easy, I think, especially if we've been lifelong Christians for this to come, become maybe something that we don't think with fresh, new, newness. Do you, are you following me? I'm gonna, we're going to sing a song that I haven't sang in a while because truthfully, it's, it's kind of, um, it's really poetic very poetic song so it can be hard to sing um and it's it's truthfully very emotional and i i i am this like middle ground here of like i don't think that our faith can be built on emotions and our obedience is not built on emotions right but also god gave us emotions to feel and so my prayer this week has just been that you would be reminded and allow your emotions to remember the gospel message can we, can we say this verse together that I know you all, you all know? For God so loved the world. This is the love that we sing about this morning. Let's continue singing.
would die for me Amazing love I know it's true So it's my joy to honor you In all best to honor God this morning. As we approach him, let's do so with the right perspective, the right posture, hallowing his name, lifting him up, putting him first, and watch how he helps everything else fall in the right place. Father, we're challenged at times by the words that we sing, the 
worship which we engage in. It's meant to bring us closer to you. Lord, at times we're good at lack of a better way of phrasing it, faking it. Pushing aside those distractions, those things that are going on and kind of going through the motions, if you will, Lord, spiritually, in a worshipful sense. If we allow the for you to speak to us, if we allow, Lord, the Spirit to reveal to us, then, Father, we can see what's in the way. I mean, what's not right? I just can't help this, this morning, Lord, to, to think and to feel and to discern, God, that there's some things in the way this morning. I just pray, Father, you'd help us to reveal those right now, Lord, to come before you humbly, surrendered, with our hearts, Father, rended open before you, giving you permission, creating space, God, for you to sit next to us, turning down the volume of, of, of life's distractions so, Lord, we hear your voice. I don't want to miss what you have for me. I pray, Father, we wouldn't want to miss what you have for each one of us. Lord, your love is amazing. When we choose to come to worship, Father, I pray it would be as an act of just that, of of praise, as an act of recognition of who you are and what it is you are doing, what it is you've done, Lord, and with confidence, Lord, what it is you're going to continue to do in our lives. may we begin our time today by honoring you, hallowing your name. It's not to say that the things that wait for us, that that we're carrying, those burdens that are very real in our lives won't be there when we're done. They will be. Lord, maybe when we spend some time with you, will you help us with our perspective? And Lord, we'll be able to just recognize no matter what it is we face, you are with us. Thank you, God, for your provision, for your care, for your physical touch, Lord. There's so much for us to give you thanks and praise for this morning. But there's also people that are grieving, Lord, that are going through and dealing with loss. We we think of of the Miller family today as they prepare to celebrate the life of Brenda's mother, Karen, Lord. I lift them up to you. I pray, Father, for those that have gone through a challenging time physically in recent weeks and it seems just like every one person gets well and then someone else, Lord, falls ill. And none of this is a surprise to you. You know it all, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, we're reminded of our need for you on a regular basis. And we just want to pause as you put people on our hearts, Lord, help us to intercede and to lift them up. Think of Terry and Gail, Gordon, Art, Lord, today, I lift them up to you. Think of Ruth, Father, this morning. As you put each one on our hearts today, help us to intercede, to be faithful. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Father, for grace. Lord, I pray today we'd hear your voice. We would know without a doubt that we're in your presence. Lord, you would continue to draw us closer to yourself. Be with us now, Lord, as we open up your word. Show us something new. Take us deeper. Reveal, Lord, more of yourself to each one of us. And in the process, Lord, help us to see ourselves in a different light. And whatever's missing, in that gap, Lord, that you show us, may we know, Lord, that the only thing that fills that is you. Father, we love you today. And thank you for the opportunity to come together as a faith family to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. We've been having this conversation for several weeks about a man named Jacob in Scripture and how his story is relevant to each one of us and how many times, if, if we take a few moments, we can find ourselves in Jacob's story. And the reason is, <clears throat> sorry, is that Jacob has a lot of baggage in his life and we're not so different. And we often carry things around on a day-to-day basis that we may not even realize what we're doing. We just get so used to it. Before long, it just becomes a normal part of, of ourselves and us, and letting go of it is difficult because it's part of our identity, and there are things that we think we need, all the while we're continuing to pursue what we think life offers to us. 
only to find ourselves falling short, lacking, wanting more of whatever this world has or what others we think can provide for us. Bags that we carry or bring about on our own or through our own actions, as is the case in Jacob's life. In Jacob, so many times he, he deceives his father, he, he, he tricks his brother. These are his choices, his things that he's doing. And he finds himself on the run for his life, dragging behind him the bags and the broken relationships that have resulted in his own actions. He ends up, as we discussed last week, at his uncle's house, about 500 miles away from Beersheba. And he meets someone that he just instantly falls in love with named Rachel. And he does things so incredibly out of character, things that just don't make sense. He commits seven years of labor for his uncle in order for Rachel's hand in marriage. But then something happens. All of Jacob's connivory and, and deceit catches up to him, and the deceiver gets deceived. Laban um, marries off, instead of Rachel, the oldest daughter, Leah. And this was the custom. This is what was done. This should not have been a surprise to Jacob. But Jacob ends up with someone he doesn't want. So he thought Rachel could fix him. Rachel would complete him. Rachel was the best. She, she was a 10 out of 10. She had the looks. She, she, she had everything. She was the complete package. And Jacob fell madly in love. And he thought, if I could just get Rachel, she would add value to my life. She would affirm in me what's missing. She would serve as a status symbol, the this, this symbol of redemption, trading his messed up existence up until this time for one that really matters. And Laban sees Jacob's desperation. Literally pulls the wool or the goat skin using Jacob's costume over his own eyes. Tricks him. Marries off the oldest daughter. Jacob, of course, realizes the next day that this isn't what he signed up for. He runs Laban. What is this you've done to me? To which Laban replied, it's not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage for the older one. This law of primogeniture that we've been talking about for several weeks, it's, it's one where the, the, the oldest comes first. The, 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 the oldest has position. The, the oldest has authority. The oldest leads. And Jacob had bypassed this, this kind of law, this custom, through his entire life. And now here it catches up to him. And Laban says to him, basically, it's not our custom. Our custom is primogeniture we, to give the younger daughter in marriage for the older one. And literally in Scripture, this is fascinating to me, Jacob is left speechless. There is no verbal response to Laban's explanation. We read in verse 26, it's not our custom to do this. Then Laban continues, finish this daughter's bridal week, then we'll give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. Just as when Jacob asked for Rachel's hand in marriage, Laban didn't say yes. Laban expresses a new opportunity for Jacob, and Jacob does not say yes. He just does it. Scripture tells us Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, his wife, and then Laban gave him, him his daughter, Rachel. Can you imagine those relationship dynamics? <laughs> the, the, the stress now that's been added to Rachel and Leah's relationship? I'm sure it was there before. This, this couldn't have been a new thing. But Jacob finally does get what he wanted. But now he's carrying even more baggage with him. Finish the week. Then marry Rachel. Serve me for seven more years. He's already served seven. And now, if you do the math, that's going to be 14 years for two wives. The typical going rate for a wife up to this point was a year and a half to two years wages. Jacob's giving 14. Things are starting to catch up to him. But I want to turn our attention today, not just to, to Jacob, but to a new character in the story, to Leah. Because while it's true that many of us carry baggage that are a result of our own choices and actions, sometimes we carry baggage that are a result of others' actions. And that's just where I think Leah fits into the story. See, Leah realizes very quickly that she's married to a man who doesn't love her that she's the consolation prize. Now understand, she also knows that her own father did this to her. Laban did this. And, and Leah, interestingly enough, is looking for love just like Jacob. 
they're just like one another. They have so much in common. Imagine her hurt when Jacob races out of the tent, runs to her father, says, why have you deceived me? This isn't what I've worked for. This isn't who I've worked for. When we go backwards in Scripture a little bit, we can kind of get an idea of what it is that Leah's been dealing with. Genesis chapter 29, verse 17 tells us that that Leah was one with weak eyes or or, or delicate eyes. Then Scripture says, but, Scripture puts the word but in there, but Rachel was lovely in form. And what we see in this moment, verse 17, is this comparison. And we tend to soften what's being said here, trying to spare Leah's feelings, trying to be nice. And the translators had trouble with this phrase, weak or delicate eyes, for a long time. They didn't know whether it meant that she had protruding eyes or that she was cross-eyed or that her eyes didn't sparkle. They're not sure how to, to, to give it some clarity. But what we know, because of the word but in the middle of the verse, and then the other side of that saying that Rachel was lovely in form, what we're left with is the fact that Leah was not. She wasn't. See, and if we're really honest, it's not referring to her vision. This passage is referring to her appearance. This is a comparison of looks. And to be blunt, Leah is unattractive. She's undesirable. And thus far, she has shown to be unweddable. Laban has not found anyone willing to marry Leah, willing to give the year and a half to two years wages in order to marry his daughter. And since Laban practices primogeniture, Rachel, the haughty, the desirable, was not yet to be given in marriage. One was not like the other. In our culture today, this is becoming a touchy conversation. Attraction is such a hot issue, (laughs) quote unquote, yet we're all attracted to certain things. It's natural. It's nature. Literally, it's nature. It's nature. If you go hunting, and, and we, we, you turkey hunt in the spring, you, don't turkey, well, you can't turkey hunt in the fall, but it's easier in the spring, because then in the spring, those hens are looking for the big tom, and those feathers will fan out, and that, the, the big tom with the big feathers, well, he'll go out, and he'll be strutting those tails out there, they're letting them women see what's going on, and those, those hens, they just come running. They're attracted. We all know that peacocks have these big, beautiful feathers to, to attract to draw in. If you're a deer hunter, the bucks with the biggest antlers, it works both ways, male and female. Even flowers, the brighter the bloom or the bigger the bloom is more attractive to the insects, which allows for more propagation. Now, I don't know how flowers do all that. God's incredible in his creative genius. But, but it's natural. Attraction is a God-given thing. So I'm not sure why we have these disconnects or why certain things happen and why certain things we find attractive and others do not. But it's not just a visual thing. We're attracted to sounds. You'd much rather hear Amy sing than me. That's okay. I'm, I'm at peace with that. It, 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 it's, it was smells. You have certain smells you like, certain ones you don't. Even touch. The way that you're touched, how you're touched. Attraction matters. What we see here in Genesis chapter 29, verse 17, is Leah, quite frankly, is not, was not attractive. Others saw Rachel, but she wasn't yet married. And the answer to the why not question is found in because Leah was unweddable. And so Laban comes and gets Jacob drunk. And under the skies of a veil, Marries off his oldest daughter to his nephew. (laughs) Boy, what a family reunion those must have been. (laughs) But here's what's also interesting to me. That Jacob has worked for seven years for this moment. And no one in seven years explained to Jacob, this is how we do things around here. Everybody had to know that Jacob was working and serving for Rachel. But no one paused or thought, let's go tell Jacob what's really going to happen. Because they all knew what was going to happen. That's just how things were done. It's not our fault that this guy who's not from around here doesn't understand how we do things here. It never came up. None of the other shepherds sought to warn him. Rachel never says anything. Laban and his family, they certainly wouldn't. This was the opportunity they were looking for, to find a husband for Leah. And then you have to wonder, where was Rachel during the wedding? 
What did Laban do with her? There's so many unanswered questions in, in this deceitful encounter. But at the end of the day, what we find is that Jacob, <laughs> let's really be honest, gets what's coming to him. But even saying that, we, we feel wrong, don't we? Because Leah shouldn't be a punishment, a consolation, or second place. We know that she's honestly a woman without many options. She's lived her entire life as the one others looked past to see the beauty in her sister. So we come to this place of realization, and I think Jacob realizes that the moment Laban says that's not how we do things around here, that Leah and Jacob are the same, looking for the same thing, looking for, for, for fulfillment, looking for love, looking for acceptance. And now we see a character in Jacob's story that understands how Jacob feels, that's searching for the same thing that Jacob's searching for, is carrying some of the same baggage been heaped upon her by others. In chapter 29, verse 30, kind of catching us up to now where we're going to talk about in Jacob's story today, we read it, his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah. And he agreed to work for Laban for another seven years. Leah has a week with her husband. Then Rachel joins the family, and by all accounts, Jacob moves on, because Leah is not the one that she, he wanted. And Leah, quite honestly, is not loved. We, we can say that because Scripture just simply tells us that. In verse 31 of chapter 29, when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, don't miss that, when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive. But Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and she named him Reuben. For she said, it's because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. For the Lord saw that Leah was not loved. And, and re Leah, recognizing the gift that God has given her, she, she acknowledges that because the Lord has seen my misery, surely Jacob will love me now. I've given him a son. Now this word not loved in verse 31 in the Hebrew, it's a word, sane. And sane literally means hated, as if an enemy. Let's put that language back in the verse. The Lord saw that Leah was hated, as if an enemy to Jacob. He enabled her to conceive. The, the, that, the language really adds another level of angst to this entire story. Leah wasn't just not liked just not desired. There was this measure in Jacob's heart that was almost disdain. She was almost looked at as an enemy. Could, you know, go backwards into Jacob's life. He understands this. He deceived his brother Esau. He tricked him out of his birthright and then the blessing. Esau then vows to kill his brother. Jacob understands hate. Jacob understands what it meant to be an enemy. And now, because of the baggage he's carrying, he's just sharing it with Leah. And we see Leah respond with this deep longing. And it's changing, beginning to change in her what it is she's searching for. Uh, this deep need within her by how she, she responds by then how she names her children. She names her first son Reuben, which means to see the Lord saw that I was not loved because the Lord has seen my misery. He's given me a son. So now Leah names her son Reuben. And her response is, surely my husband will love me now. He'll see what I've given him and he'll love me. He'll be reminded every day when he calls his son by name that he needs to see me. See, Jacob, I've given you what every man wants, a son. Jacob doesn't see. Nothing changes. I love sometimes in Scripture how quickly the narrative moves. <laughs> because right one verse later, we read that she conceived again. Nine months passes between verse 32 and verse 33. And she gave birth to a son. And she says, because the Lord heard that I'm not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. 
My, my husband didn't see my need, but the Lord has heard me. Now perhaps Jacob will now hear me. And she names him Simeon. Simeon means to hear or one who hears. Yet Jacob doesn't hear. Nothing changes. Verse 34. Again, she conceived. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now at last my husband will become attached to me, because I have borne him three sons. So she na- he was named Levi. Levi means to be attached, to be connected. And Jacob is still not connected to his first wife, Leah. God saw, God heard, God continues to give. Leah longs to be seen, longs to be heard, longs to be held. And you would think hearing the names of his sons every day that Jacob would get a clue. Especially given that he used to be the one longing for the same things. To be seen and to be heard and to be held by his father. Theologian Tim Keller explains that Leah represents something symbolically that we all want in our lives at some point, the, what Rachel represents, we all want the best. We don't get up in life thinking, oh, today I want to accept mediocre. I want to just chase after the mundane today, the average. We, we, we are motivated to want the best. But when we look to things or to people to fill our lives, we wake up in the morning, as Keller puts it, with Leah. And this gap or this lack between the best that we want and the Leah that we have uh, the, the, that's where the baggage then becomes real. That's the opportunity for the baggage to become part of our lives, is what we used to fill that gap between what it is that we want and what it is that we have. And what we often miss is that Leah is looking for much more than love at this point in her life. She's looking to be valued, to be looked upon the same way that a father would look upon the oldest. Primogeniture changes things. And what we see in Jacob is this foretaste of what Jesus is going to do. He's going to flip this whole narrative that everyone is valued. And Jacob is going to become a means in which we see the birth of Jesus. But we're not quite there yet. See, Leah is looking for meaning and fulfillment. And we, she, through her, we, we kind of follow along and we are looking for a savior just as she was then. Leah continues to call out to God and each time that we read in, in Genesis chapter 29 and we see the word Lord in, in our English translations, it's the word Jehovah that Leah is using, Yehovah. She's calling out the personal proper name of God, the God of grace, the God of covenant, and God shows up. And over the years of giving birth to these sons, we begin to see a change in Leah. That change that comes to fulfillment in verse 35. And in verse 35, we begin to see a change in not just in Leah, but a change in the narrative of what God's doing. She conceived again, Scripture tells us, and when she gave birth to a son, her fourth son, she said, this time, this time, I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. If you've heard nothing else this morning, I pray that you hear the next few moments. Because so often we read through Scripture and we don't fail to recognize the significance of what's happening. She named him Judah. Yahuda. Scripture, Yahuda. And what Yahuda literally means, is, is, probably it means, is, is praised. And the word Yahuda comes from the, from the Jewish word, the Hebrew word Yada, which literally means to throw or to cast, in this context, Praise. I'm going to throw praise at you. I'm, I'm going to cast my praises to you, God. It's this literal motion where you're using your hands and you're, you're just casting something upon God. And Leah at this point now giving birth to her fourth son says, I'm going to name my son. This time I will praise the Lord. And, and she's just casting her praises to God. She says, I'm going to name my son Judah. Yahuda. I'm going to praise God. Because what he has given me. Still wanting to be loved, but choosing now instead to praise. Now, there are seven Hebrew words for praise. We won't go through them all, but we talked last year during Lent about halal, the word of praise, zamar, and shabak. 
But yada is the most frequently used. And, and, and yada being the root for the name Judah, don't miss this. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Leah's son Judah, would become the tribe from which Jesus Christ would be born. Jesus is from the tribe of Yahuda, Yada, the tribe of praise. Is that an accident? <laughs> no. God is so incredibly creative. And this is the first time you ever see the word Yada used in Scripture. And it's used when the birth of Judah, from whom Jesus would come, is born into the world. That should excite you. That's where praise comes from. Leah goes through the scenarios in life where she's just looking to be embraced, loved, and accepted. And it only comes when she gets to the point where she's willing to praise God and recognize who he is. The same is true for us today. All the baggage we carry, they're empty. They're empty until we realize that it's Jesus that we need. And when we get to that point, that, that place where we're willing to praise him in spite of everything else that's going on in our life, in spite of everything else in life that we don't have, then he can step into this void and do in our lives what only he can do. And we are left with one response to yada. The only thing we can do in the midst of God's grace is praise him. You don't deserve it. We'll never earn it. It's not something we, we can work for. It's something that he gives us. When we specifically make a confession about God with our mouth and we raise our hands in thanksgiving, we then are yada. Yada. You don't have to turn to it right now, but if you wanted an explanation or in more details of this in Psalm 136, we see a great example of yada praise. It's translated as give thanks in, in Psalm 136, but this yada confession we, we see in Psalm 136 at the end, it tells us that his mercy endures forever, and there's this incredibly long list of, uh, of God's greatness and wonders and all the things that he's done, not in, in the life of the Jewish people and of his chosen people, the descendants of Jacob. And we're left with praise. Not just with our mouths, but with our hands. And we find in Scripture these two things go literally hand in hand. Then Scripture says something interesting. Then Leah stops having children. And we take away from that fact that at the moment that she no longer needs to have children to add value to her life or to cause her husband to see her. She stops looking for acknowledgement from someone and now chooses to be the one who acknowledges. And her only appropriate response? Praise. And every time she called on the name of her son Judah, she'd be reminded to praise. What has happened is that Leah's finally come to a place where she understands that her value is found in a relationship with God. Yahweh. Jehovah. She stops looking for Jacob to fill the void and looks to God. And Leah, at least for a time, a season, figures it out and she lets go of her bags. That's not to say everything after this moment's perfect. I talk about a soap opera. Um, Rachel starts to get upset that she doesn't have children and Leah has four, so she complains to Jacob. And Jacob says, was it my fault that you can't have kids? Why are you blaming me for? And, and Rachel gives Jacob her maidservant to become his third wife. Rachel's maidservant gives birth to two sons, and Leah's like, well, I'm not going to let her catch up. So Leah gives her maidservant to Jacob for his fourth wife. Leah's maidservant has two sons, and then, then Leah somehow is able to have two more sons, and then the daughter. Rachel finally does, after this, have two sons. And now we see Jacob with all of these kids. <laughs> and if we go back to Genesis chapter 17 and God's covenant with Abraham, God said to Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Abraham at the time had no children, couldn't see how this was possible. Well, here comes Jacob. Jacob's taking care of that for you, Abraham. And of his sons, they would each become a tribe, a tribe of people that God would use to create his chosen, the nation of Israel. We'll get to the Israel part next week. But for now, <laughs> take all of that chaos to push it aside for now leah praises 
It's all that's happened to her. Lifetime of looks and jokes and laughter and being rejected, ignored, passed over. For now, she's able to push that aside. She praises God. Jacob had sought out Rachel. But perhaps God had chosen Leah. Jacob wanted a family through Rachel, but God opened Leah's womb. It's through Leah, not Rachel, that we see the child of promise come. See, ultimately, we, we look in the Old Testament, and Abraham could look at Isaac as a child of promise, and Isaac might look at, or like Rebecca, might look at Jacob as a child of promise. But the child of promise was Jesus, the Messiah. And we see through Leah's family, the Messiah come. I don't think that's an accident. We also see through Leah the Levites, who would become the priests, the spiritual leaders. Those who would help lead spiritually the nation of Israel. God redeemed Leah's life in some pretty powerful ways. And we discover in this narrative that Jacob still has some learning to do. <laughs> he gets Rachel, he gets what he wanted. But she doesn't quite bring him the fulfillment he desires. In fact, the expectations that exist between the two only seem to cause more complications, more tension. Because there's expectation that it's so high, it can't possibly be fulfilled. And it leads to conflict. Even more in the future. Problems and deceit. But today... For now, Leah praises. And perhaps you're still searching for something. Maybe you can define it, maybe you can't. Or perhaps you're still not sure what it is that you're seeking. But, you, but, but know this, church, our journeys all lead to the same place. Jesus. They all lead there. Whether or not we choose to accept him, whether or not we choose to call him by name, whether or not we choose to realize he's the child of promise, from the line of Leah, and from him is birthed genuine praise. So when you find Jesus, the only natural response that makes sense is we praise him. Not just with our mouths, but with our hands. Perhaps we can get a little closer to, to what we're searching for by stopping today and praising. This is the only response I think that makes sense for us, is acknowledging God instead of seeking acknowledgement. So today, as we close, we will praise. And I hope you will yada. I know for some it's uncomfortable. I get it. But can I, I, I want to encourage you to keep loosening your grip on your baggage. Because too often, we, we come to church, and, and, and we, we come to worship, and, and we want to praise God, and we show up, and we come, and we want to, oh, Lord, I praise you. The problem is we can't do this very long. And we can't do this truthfully and honestly and transparently. So what ends up happening is we, we, we get weighed down by it, and eventually, it not only pulls down our arms, but our hearts, and our spirits, sometimes even causes us to keep our mouths shut. I understand worship, singing's not for everyone. I, I get that. But we were given a voice by our creator. And we see in Leah's explanation, her experiences, that the only thing left to do when God sees and hears and acknowledges us is to praise him uninhibitedly, without reservation, without worrying about what others think without caring what someone might be thinking about us. We just praise him because of who he is. With lifted hands are empty hands. Because lifted hands can't be holding on to our bags. So as Amy comes and we prepare to close and respond today, just as we, when we took communion last week, you, you can't hold on to the elements, the body and the blood of Christ of holding on to your baggage. We can't praise him holding on to our baggage either. I invite you to stand with me. 
I'm going to pray and then invite Jesus to come, to draw close, to sit beside, to whisper in your ear, to come in front of us. Then we need to respond in the only way that makes sense. Yada. Yada. Father, we do pray for you. Pray, Lord, that you would come. You would remind. That you would encourage. That you would lift up. For the one, Lord, today that needs to be seen, Lord, help them to know that you see them. For the one, Father, today that needs to be heard, help them to know, God, you hear them. For the one, Lord, longing to be held, Lord, would you put your arms around them? Every day, Lord, we go through life searching for something. Help us not to settle. Or to think that we found it in the baggage that we carry. And Lord, as we now respond in the only way that makes sense, by praising you for who you are and what it is you've done, what it is you're doing even right now in this moment, I pray, Lord, that we would, yada, we would praise you. We would let go of those things that weigh us down. And just for a moment, Lord, even in this short moment, to remind us of what it feels like when we heed Jesus' words, to come to you all who are weary and heavy laden, that God, we could find rest. We find rest, Lord, when we find you. I pray, Lord, you would be the answer to whatever it is we're searching for today. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's worship him together. My words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I
Father, I pray that the bags we've just let go has allowed us, Father, to truly praise you, to yada, to cry out, Judah. Lord, we would just leave them on the ground where they are. Lord, you would then fill the space in our lives that the baggage, Lord, we're occupying and taking up. We don't need them. We can leave them there. God, thank you for seeing and for hearing, for holding, for loving. And Lord, as we go, may we go as people who praise. That's a, we have a world, Lord, that needs to see that. To recognize that there is an answer to all the things that we search for. His name is Jesus. Through our testimony, Lord, through our actions, through our words, through our praise, may others see, hear, and know that they too can be held by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Great day.